it's lunch break here on this bridge. Uh, a lot of people, especially the maids and all the uh, people that work for other people in Hong Kong, they set up their blankets and they bring their kind of food that they prepared at home and they just hang out here all day on the weekends when they get some time up. Fairly vibey, fairly interesting place. You know what else is interesting? All of this freaking paranoia in the air on the news, especially in Western media, if you turn on the news like BBC or CNN or Fox or any of these big news networks, you will see constant, constant stories about how there is a threat of war from China and particularly uh, America going to war with China. The challenge is the impact of China's rise and the international order of which the U.S. has been the principal architect and guardian. A report says that the U.S. has lost its military edge and could lose a war against China-Russia. Which directly called out the threats from Russia and from China. So today I'm going to talk about whether that's a feasible thing. Obviously I'm not like some sort of political commentator or some expert on the topic, but having lived in China for 10 years, I kind of have my pulse on the situation and how I think things will end up going down. See, China plays the slow game. What do I mean by that? Well, everybody knows that the USA has been the world police for a very, very long time. The difference is China likes to play victim and kind of raise awareness about how other countries are taking advantage of it to gain superiority and to gain, you know, kind of favor with the world's populace. For example, China likes to adhere to environmental principles and sign all these treaties and stuff about carbon emissions and pollution levels. And they, they adhere to them and they, they stick to them on paper but immediately give up on them as soon as it's convenient for them or they feel like they've been slighted by the rest of the world. And that's just how China works. We can never look at China through the same lens that we look at other nations that have been allied for a very, very long time. China is a new player on the world stage and their rules are very different the way that Chinese culture works compared to the West. You can look at an example like the rhino horn issue. As soon as China figures out that the rest of the world is super pissed off because the rhinos are being hunted to extinction for their horn, for Chinese traditional medicine, the government is very quick to jump on that and be like, okay, we're banning this trade because it's making China look bad. It's always about face, right? As soon as China is slighted by the rest of the world, uh, America is pulling all this uh, Huawei business and the rest of the world is jumping on the bandwagon, they're immediately like, you know, you know what, we're going to hunt rhinos again. That's how shady and kind of weird the whole China situation works. Whereas in conflict situations around the world, the U.S. has typically taken a military approach and is very in your face. It does get backlash from tons of other Western allied nations, but by and large, the U.S. typically represents the Western world's feelings about issues around the world. Whereas China definitely doesn't represent the majority of the world's feelings about how things are working. So no one is claiming that the USA is some sort of saint in this situation, but you know, the actions are usually typically tolerated or accepted by other allied nations, like I said. China, on the other hand, if they were to take military action, and this is all this paranoia, paranoia in the Western media, China is the next big enemy. The next big war is going to be with China. China is going to take military action against Japan and America and all these countries. If China were to do that, they would be absolutely obliterated in the media. No one's going to take China's side. China basically has no allies. So I just don't see that happening. Their kind of plan for world dominance, as we say, their slow brewing approach at kind of taking over people's minds and thoughts and opinions, about how it does things, how it runs its government, how it controls the populace, that would all be dead. That would all be done. It would just take one little match, one little uh, conflict in the South China Sea or something to really change people's minds about China. And that's not what China is trying to do. You see, China is instead taking to the internet, uh, universities abroad, opening social media accounts, creating raps and songs. A lot of these things aren't working, but a lot of them are slowly working and slowly changing people's opinion about China not being this huge hammer and sickle, red scare, terrifying communist country that's trying to take over the world. More of a happy-go-lucky, you know, we do things a little bit differently. This is what's wrong about your country. This is what we're doing better. And it's a very, very slow approach. It's a very moderate approach. China never jumps into something and really just tries to change the world because that's when people start to get scared. People are starting to accept China and accept the way it's doing things. Things like Wu Mao or paid internet trolls as we've spoken about before. These Wu Maos and paid internet trolls use the hypocrisy and absolute ridiculous nature of the way the Chinese internet works to promote a government that squashes personal freedom and freedom of speech. So you have a country that blocks all these social media accounts, creates their own to promote the government and then pays people in China or even abroad 
to send uh, really, really positive messages and, and kind of crap on and, and make other na nations look bad because they're free and China's doing things correctly. And there's actually a really funny story. This woman, she was a very, very famous Wu Mao, a paid internet troll. She actually called herself the General Wu Mao. And she said very atrocious things. She actually made a reference. Everyone knows about the Nanjing massacre that happened uh, in China where the Japanese kind of did horrible rapes and atrocities and all kinds of really, really bad things in the 1930s. She called for a uh, Tokyo massacre. She said the same thing should happen in Japan in retaliation for what they did to China. So that's the kind of nature of these Wumaos, these internet trolls. They're not to be taken seriously. But the irony here is that after she had gone to America to travel, came back with her husband, and the Chinese government disappeared her husband because of something he did politically. We're not quite sure of the details, but he's gone. She is stuck in China. She's got an exit ban. And she is now appealing to the Australian government to keep an eye on the human rights abuses of the Chinese government to ch try to help find her husband. So the whole irony of the situation is, I mean, I can't say I'm applauding this whole situation. It's kind of, kind of bad to say that, but it's hard to feel bad for her. And it's hard to feel bad for these people that go behind this veil of security that the Chinese government seems to provide, become blatant nationalists, stoke you know, international nationalism amongst Chinese people, not even Chinese citizens, just Chinese people abroad, into thinking that everybody is against them and China needs to stand up to the world. To see this kind of situation happen, it's, it's ironic, it's a little funny, and you're gonna see more of this kind of thing in the future. So that's how complicated this whole control game that China's playing. Like I said, it's not a US military conflict that says, hey, Syria's leader is bad, we're gonna go over there and bomb them. China is a slow brewing process. They use things like the social credit score, the huge surveillance network, lots and lots of police presence at every single street corner watching what people are doing, internet censorship, blocking, squashing protests, locking up kids in universities that are actually promoting Marxism too much. This whole kind of domestic control is the first approach. Then you have the little spindly fingers going out to the rest of the world that's trying to make China look good through soft power. That's the way China does things. They want a subdued and controlled population domestically first before they go out and try to take other territories. And they would never dream of trying to go take Western territories because the hearts and minds of Westerners are very difficult to win over. But what isn't difficult to win over are third world nations. And that's where we see the Belt and Road Project. Unfortunately, the reality of this situation is that most people in the world don't pay attention to poor people. If you look at the news and you see a school shooting in the US on Reddit, it'll be the top thing, 10,000 upvotes, hundreds or thousands of comments there. Then you see and maybe 20 people died. You see uh, something that happened in Iraq or Syria or the Middle East or Africa, two, three comments, two, three upvotes. That's the unfortunate nature of the world is that the developed world gets more priority. So when China makes these Belt and Road projects and makes these huge mountainous debt piles for a lot of these nations that are gonna, getting sucked into this, a lot of dictatorships in Africa and things, most people aren't paying attention. The world doesn't pay attention to the develop, developing world. So China's got a real good foothold and a real good slow approach to kind of get these ports, to get these military bases, to get these resources, and to get all of this uh, kind of third world control before they ever make another step. So do I think there's gonna be a war between America and China? No, but the war that we're talking about is a war of hearts and minds, it's a war of third world development, and it's a world of ports, roads, and investment. And if there's a war to win, that's the war that China's gonna win. Now I know that sounds a little bit terrifying and also a little bit boring at the same time because there's a lot of aspects that need to be covered and addressed in this scenario, but keep in mind that mass media, things outside of YouTube and things outside of social media where you know, myself and Winston, who I work with on ADV China, we basically just go around and say things that we see, things that we experience, people that we talk to, instead of having some sort of grand narrative about this whole thing. And that can be a little bit more boring than the kind of stuff that the mass media is trying to label and push in your face. Uh, but it's also scaremongering. It's a way to resurrect a dying medium with clicks and uh, kind of getting people all excited and riled up. So keep that in mind next time you see any news, you know, regarding the relationship between America and China, because it's obviously much more complicated than they'd like you to think. I hope you guys liked the video. Let me know what you think down in the comment section. What do you think is gonna happen in the future? Are things gonna go south? Are things gonna kind of fizzle out? Are things gonna get worse? Um, let me know down in the comment section, and also give this video a thumbs up if you did indeed like it. And if you wanna see more and support the channel, go to patreon.com slash 86 I want to say that I don't want you to forget 
that if you go down below right here, you can watch another Lava to Six video every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. EST. Up here, you can watch ADV China, a motorcycle talk show on two wheels with uh, Winston and I, where we ride around our motorcycles and talk about societal issues every single Monday at 1 p.m. EST. And right below that, you can watch Serpents a Day, Winston, on Friday at 1 p.m. EST. Thank you so much, Lumeters, and I'll catch you on the next one.